Please take a moment to silence your own devices. We would like to remind you that food and drink are not permitted in the future. Also, please note that photography and audio and video recording is prohibited. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Megan Kaysafer from the New York Times. For 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, social justice, politics, and literature. I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with six-time Academy Award nominee Glenn Close and best-selling author Meg Walzer. The two will discuss their new film, The Wife, and the themes it explores, womanhood, self-discovery, liberation, and more. The film opens on August 17th and is based on Walitzer's critically acclaimed novel by the same name. This evening's conversation will be moderated by Parul Sagal, book critic at the New York Times. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Parul Sagal, Meg Wolitzer, and Glenn Close. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm enormously honored to be here with these two masters of their craft. And thank you so much to everyone for coming out. Um, I wanted to start with a clip from The Wife, um, just in case people here haven't read it. If you haven't, shame on you. Why are you depriving yourselves? <laughs> Get out of here and read it. Um, what do you need to know? Um, you need to know that John and Joan have been married for a very long time for this clip. Um, they met when Joan was John's graduate student, and not graduate, college student. Yeah, undergrad. Yeah. Undergrad. Very talented. Smith. At Smith. Do we have a relative 50s. year? Should we give them a year? 50s. The 50s. 50s. Um, very talented, bright. They married. She sort of suppressed her talent. He went on to become this great sort of literary eminence. And in the scene we're about to see, he's celebrating that he's just won the Nobel Prize. To quote from the Meditations of Quixote, I am I plus my surroundings. And if I do not preserve the latter, I do not preserve myself. Today, I am the happiest of men. I have my health, give or take a few bypasses. Huh? <laughs> I have you, my wonderful friends, my ever curious students, my son, David, my beautiful daughter, Susanna, and a future grandchild who at this moment is happily floating in her mother's amniotic fluid. <laughs> and finally, finally, I have my beautiful wife, Joan. The love of my life. John, come here. The love of my life. Without this woman, I am nothing. In fact, my greatest achievement is, well, persuading this woman to marry me. <laughs> How? Please get him to wrap no. it up. <laughs> Two, Joe Ziff Castleman, who, in my opinion, is the greatest living author of the 20th century. Joe! Joe! Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. So, when I heard that The Wife was going to be a film, I, I had one of those moments of anxiety that book people get sometimes. This book I love. How are you going to translate this onto the screen? Especially because it is so internal. And then you see a scene like this, which has one of the most eloquent silences I think I've seen. And I think in last count, I had 14 distinct facial expressions that Glenn Close makes <laughs> during that scene. And I wanted to talk to, to both of you and to hear you both talk to each other about what it means to create a character for the page and what it means to create a character for the screen. 
So Meg, perhaps you can start and just tell us a little bit about where um, Joan came from, her genesis. Um, you know, I am the uh, daughter of a writer. My mother is a novelist, Hilma Wallitzer, who's 88 and fantastic and writing and wonderful. And um, I grew up seeing the things that she went through a bit. I mean, very, very different, not like this book at all. But when she published her first novel, the headline in the newspaper read, housewife turns into novelist. And she has joked that it was as if she was Clark Kent going into a phone booth <laughs> to change into a superhero uniform, like it was this feat that a woman could do this at that period of time. And to give you a sense of her sort of mindset back then, the first short story she wrote was called Today a Woman Went Mad in the Supermarket. And I think if she hadn't started writing, she might have gone a little mad too. So I was just in the milieu of writers. But I've always been interested in women and power and ambition, subjects around that. So I don't know. I mean, people say write what you know. I often think it's write what obsesses you. And this was something that I thought about all the time. So Joan kind of came up out of the primordial ooze of my obsessions. And in the book, it's in first person, and it's a very funny, pissed off narrative. And in the film, so much of what Glenn does is in her face and is what is not said. And that's so powerful and amazingly different. So oh. how do you prepare for a role like this? <laughs> what, what does one do? How do you, how do you um, transmute this all into? I read the script. I had not read the book. And Shame. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I have to read more fiction, I have to say. Um, uh, I liked it, there was enough there for me to say pretty much immediately, yes, um, I'll put my name on this because that's what you do if it's an independent movie and they're trying to get financing and everything. And then I think almost five years went by. And because uh, you wrote it 15 years ago. Yeah, it came out in 2003. And it, this is like, it's a labor of love, getting it made. It was the, the screenwriter, Jane Anderson, at one point sent me the most poignant, sad email that said, I fear, my friend, we have reached the end. <laughs> but we hadn't. This thing wanted to come out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, when we, we finally uh, gathered in Glasgow, where we shot the, most of the movie, and sat around a table, and I had questions, and the, the question that I hadn't um, asked, uh, um, gotten an answer to was, why didn't she leave him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was afraid that all the women who saw this movie would just jump up screaming, oh, just leave him. <laughs> right. uh, but I have to find, I have to find in all my characters, and I, there's never any kind of, formula of how to get into it, but I have to find where I can love them, um, where I have a common humanity with them. And to ask that question, why didn't she leave him, led me to, uh, with the collaboration of Jane, and we worked a lot on the script and, and Joan's whole emotional, uh, psychological journey, um, and of course with Jonathan, um, that journey led me to a place where I thought I understood her and I loved her. I think it's actually really connected because I have to love my characters too. Um, we're all trapped in our skins. You know, we're all, as a child, I remember noticing that you could always see the side of your nose and I thought, oh my God, my whole life I'm gonna have this view? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, right? <laughs> but you are yourself. And I feel a, a humanity about that. I, also, but just to push back on that, yes, you're you, but I think both of you have found ways to be so many people doing what you do. Um, and to just you know, talk about your roles. So Joan joins Alex Forrest, the Marquise, Eleanor of Aquitaine twice, I think. Once. Just once? Norma Desmond twice. Norma Desmond twice. Blanche Dubois, Patty Hughes, and of course, Cruella de Vil. And, uh, yeah. So these are some of the most interesting. Albert Nobbs twice. Albert Nobbs. Yeah. And so, I mean, these are some of the most interesting characters um, of your generation, or frankly, of any generation, I think it's fair to say. But as I was thinking about the roles that you played, um, I, was, I was so moved um, to recall that 
you didn't start out playing these kinds of complicated, thorny women. You, you started out playing the mother and carp and, and these girlfriends and earth mothers. And I was wondering, when did that shift happen for you, that you either started seeking out these other kinds of roles or they came to you? Uh, yeah, starting out as Jenny Fields. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I, they were all sisters of Jenny Fields. And um, it wasn't really until Fatal Attraction, I think, <laughs> when um, uh, the big question was, but can she be sexy? <laughs> and uh, Spoiler, she could. I, that's, <laughs> I went to see the, the producer make, meet him at some hotel here, and I had a little summer dress on, a little straw hat. <laughs> and... Um, I don't know, I guess I, what I said was interesting enough to then warrant being, uh, go for, uh, out to LA and to read with Michael, but um, uh, I forget the question. The question, <laughs> the question is, I think, in, in a way, and it is related to what happens, or rather what doesn't happen in the wife. It's a question of the swerve you took to sort of stepping into a, a bigger kind of ambition for yourself. It's what Joan never really does in the, in the film. You know, she becomes the helpmeet. She becomes sort of handmade into this genius. But when I think about y your career... I, you, you know, I think I, I earned getting the role of mm -hmm. Fatal Attraction. Mm -hmm. um, it, Sherry Lansing, who, was, who, was the, the, who co-produced that movie all those years ago and then was a very successful head of Paramount for a lot of years. She wrote a book, and she has that chapters about fatal attraction. And I didn't know until she told me how much they didn't want me. <laughs> they, I had gotten you know, to be known enough that they were embarrassed that my agent insisted they see me. And she didn't want to meet me because she didn't want to tell me that I didn't get the job. And it was literally after a, um, I did a, a video with Michael that they pretty much on the spot. Um, I think the director went down the hall and said, "You've got to, you've got to see this." So I really thank God I didn't know. <laughs> it was a mercy, you know. They were feeling sorry for me and letting me read. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I you know, I think I, I earned, I earned that. Mm -hmm. And um, with that um, came um, uh, the first, the first full, full character for me to play. Mm -hmm. Maggie you wrote a very influential essay that kind of touches on these themes called The Second Shell. You wrote it for the book review a few years ago. And it was about, um, it was about how books by women are... Please talk louder, please. We don't hear it in here. It's a book, it's a book, it was an essay about how books written by women are given short shrift from the, from, from the get-go. The covers look different. The font looks different. They're not treated like an event, these books. And you wrote this incredible essay that sort of felt to me like a game changer in, 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 in how women's books were being discussed. But also it felt to me in, in, in your own career. I feel like the interestings came out and sort of, I mean, I, my roundabout way of, of, of asking is sort of, did you also have a moment where you felt you were stepping into and, and being more ambitious and sort of um, stepping out of a life that, you know, or, or that felt safer and, and simpler and, and taking this leap. Yeah, I actually think it was The Wife. I think that was mm. the first book. It's the mm. first book that I wrote that was, I think, in first person. Mm. And I allowed her to kind of let it rip. I now sort of think my motto these days is, if not now, when? <laughs> but the idea of having a book being treated as small or domestic because you're writing about family or marriage or sex or things that you're thinking about all the time upset me. I mean, in terms of how books looked, one of the things that I dealt with in this piece was the way some books by women had covers that I jokingly called Little Girl in a Field of Wheat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> little Girl looking at a body of water? Yeah, or even women in water kind of floating. Mm -hmm. But you could never imagine two men sort of on a, you know, a train station, hey Bill, what's that you're reading? Little Girl in a Field of Wheat, I loved it. Uh, oh yeah, I read the sequel, Little Girl in a Field of Rye. You know, it's not, it's not going to happen. And books by men sometimes had the big, bold typeface that said, as a publicist uh, said, this book is an event. And you would keep people away. You would segregate. I feel that fiction, which we know uh, teaches empathy, mm -hmm. 
but more than that is a deeply pleasurable way of understanding human experience is for everyone. It is for everyone. I want to know what it's like to be a certain man or a certain woman. And the idea that fiction might sort of, you, you don't need to trouble yourself reading this one, that's not right for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is it like to come back to this book um, 15 years later? Well, I started looking at it. Now there's this new great movie tie-in edition with <laughs> you and Jonathan are on the outside and I'm inside. Um, <laughs> It's so weird when you read something that you've written. I always like to play a game with myself. How would I finish writing the line? Would I write it the same way? And actually, usually I would, which is funny. So it's not that you have to remember what you wrote, but your instincts are probably the same. I was touched by it. It was like running into, I hate to say this, but it was like running into an old friend in a way. I mean, it had that quality about it because I usually don't go back and look at what I do. I kind of, I'm going through life just sort of plunging ahead, but because of this, I wanted to see if some of the lines were from the book or from the film. I couldn't remember. It's all now one, in a way. Hmm. Are there lines from the book? Yeah, now? definitely. Yeah, the line about, it's a, well, I don't want to, I have to thread a needle very carefully because there are some things that happen in this. This woman has secrets. Joan has many secrets. secrets. It's not the sixth to... sense, but it's like the eighth <laughs> sense. It's like the eighth <laughs> sense. <laughs> But there are some lines that are either slightly different or the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, as I was watching the movie, I was, I was floored um, because we see, we see Joan as she is in the clip we just saw, married to her husband who's sort of becoming this juggernaut of literary power. Um, but we also, it cuts back to when they first met. And I was floored by the performance of the actress who plays the young Joan who I later discovered is your daughter mm -hmm. and does an incredible job. And it felt very apt in this film that is about a marriage, but it's also about um, the relationships between women in, in similar fields. It's about mentorship, and that's something you have written about um, very powerfully in your latest book, The Female Persuasion. But in some form, it's, it chimes and rhymes in, in almost everything you've written. Um, and I wanted to ask you both, in, in in your careers, um, were there relationships with other women that were solace, that were um, sources of inspiration or warning? Hmm. Um, not many. No. No. I mean, really? That's no. I, I guess a real mentorship relationship. Not really, no. I, 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 uh, I always admired Catherine Hepburn a lot. Both our, we came from Connecticut and both our fathers were doctors. And, uh, I was shorter than she was, for sure. Um, and I, you know, I, I saw the, the Dick Cavett interview when I was painting uh, scenery backstage and it galvanized me. I knew I'd wanted to be an actress from a very early age, but at that moment, it, something in me uh, dropped, you know, the penny dropped, and I said, if that's what you want to be, just do it. <laughs> and I went to the head of the theater department and asked to be um, sent or, or nominated for some uh, national auditions, and I got my first job from that. So I've always kind of connected her mm. to that one seminal moment that, you know, it was the last day that the stamp could be put on the letter. Um, but as far as, I, you know, I think of the people that I've worked with in, in, in my profession as, as great collaborators, um, but as far as mentors, I never went to acting school. I, um, I was 22 when I went to college, so I was, though in college I had a great mentor, but uh, it was a man, mm -hmm. head of the theater department at the College of William and Mary, uh, and he understood m the seriousness of mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. intent. In this, so. mm -hmm. Sad to say, yeah. no. The Catherine Hepburn is a North Star, as yeah. it should be. <laughs> What about you, Mike? I definitely did. Yes. I don't, we didn't call it that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, I am your protege, you are my mentor. I mean, that sounds so formal. But um, 
Nora Ephron was someone who was really important to me, and uh, she, the first film she directed was based on another book of mine. Uh, it was made into the film This Is My Life, and uh, starring uh, Julie Kavner as a stand-up comic and her two daughters, uh, Samantha Mathis and Gabby Hoffman. And it, you know, it didn't make any money, but the people who saw it, I see some smiles, you know, loved it, and it was about mothers and daughters and ambition. And Nora was always so encouraging. She made me sort of want, like think that it was okay to be funny, that, that it was serious to be funny. And another, and going back to my mother for a moment, um, from a very early age when I wanted to write, and writing is such a big issue in this film, uh, she never said, you know, you should fall back on going to law school. And I gave, I gave a reading somewhere, and a woman stood up uh, during the Q&A and said, my daughter wants to be a playwright, but I know how hard it is for women to make it and how hard it is for anyone to make it. What should I tell her? And I said, is she good? And she said, yes. And I said, well, is she burning to do it? She, she said, is she, burning to, is she burning to do it? And she said, yes. And I said, well, I think you should tell her that's wonderful because the world will whittle your daughter down, but a mother never should, and my mother never did. Hmm. And that's a kind of mentorship and feminism in action, really. Mm -hmm. well, what about dialogue between generations right now? I mean, it's something that in this moment of Me Too and Time's Up and you feel like women are speaking to each other in different industries and across industries and finding commonality in, in horrible, ho horrible ways. Um, do you feel like that kind of dialogue is, is still happening and still nourishing? Um, uh, Women. I think it's important to talk. Yeah. I think it's essential. I mean, some, you know, we're in the middle of it. Like, I was on book tour for the Female Persuasion. If I went into did something, I came out an hour later, something was new mm -hmm. in the news. But it's important to talk. How could it, you know, how could it not be? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, um, absolutely. Uh, I was just thinking of the difference of generations. Even I, I worried that Annie playing a character who uh, was a student before feminism, really, right. um, that she wouldn't understand it. Oh, wow. You know, because yeah. her sensibility is so not that. Yeah. Did you talk to her about the part? Yeah, I think what she did, she, <clears throat> she thought of her grandmothers, and as I thought of my mom, and they were very dynamic women. Her paternal uh, grandmother was a chemist on the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. Uh, gave up everything to Amazing. to raise a family, and that was it. She that she did not, and yet she, Annie said she felt that at the end of her life there was a certain kind of wistfulness, a certain feeling of lack of fulfillment. As same with my mother, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's tragic. Yeah. You know, I think I think ideally people should find personal fulfillment in whatever they do. Um, uh, so, so I was I was gratified with with um, Annie understanding that what women were dealing with, um, but I'm very proud of being in this movie because the fact that it took so long to make speaks to the Me Too. Hmm. It speaks to that a movie written by uh, based on a novel written by a woman, a screenplay by a woman. Um, called The Wife, <laughs> hard to make. And no American actor wanted to be in a movie called The Wife. <laughs> Think about it. Um, it Is that took, true? Yes. It was very hard to wow. cast. Yeah. Very hard to cast. The British um, uh, have a, uh, you know, I mean, <sighs> uh, who knows, I mean, <laughs> I <won't. laughs> anyway. And then, and we'll then get it out the, of fact, the fact <laughs> that it was made yeah. and uh, that we also have a female editor, mm -hmm. we had a female costumer, it the, the, would not have been made without our female producer, uh, uh, and then how many other female producers we had. And it's, it's mainly with this yeah. female, with a female, with a study of femaleness mm -hmm. and female rage among other things a lot of you know, but it's also a movie that that is not just for women I no mean, it's it's a oh no astounding no. astounding but it feeds it really it really 
as most important, it's about a very, very specific relationship, a very specific marriage to very specific people. But because of that, I think everybody uh, brings whatever they have to it, you know? And so I think it's incredibly relevant and certainly provokes conversation. The compromises that people make in a long relationship mm -hmm. are, is, you know, are so explored here so beautifully. Somebody said, and I'm not sure if it's Robert Louis Stevenson, so don't quote me on this, that this line, marriage is a long conversation, mm -hmm. which I love. Mm -hmm. And in this one, it's a long, complicated mm -hmm. conversation. Uh, which perfectly sets I was going to say, or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, perfectly sets up another clip we should see. Um, in this scene, Joan is in Helsinki, I believe, and she's talking to Stockholm. 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 Because, and she's, oh, we should say that the Oh, and the book, book is different, but it's the, not the Nobel. In the book, I made up a prize called the, the Helsinki Prize mm -hmm. that's like a couple of steps down. It's like the slightly sad Nobel. <laughs> <laughs> but in the movie, but he the gets movie, the Nobel. It's the real Nobel. <laughs> So she's, she's sitting in Stockholm and she's talking to um, this would-be biographer of her husband, this overweening character played beautifully by Christian Slater. And uh, so perhaps we can see that clip. Nathaniel, if you're trolling for nuggets of bitterness, you'll find none here. <laughs> Shucks. Mm. Now, speaking of bitterness, uh, I spoke to his ex, Carol. How is she? She's good. She's a, she's a psychiatrist. Oh, good for her. Yeah. And their daughter, Fanny? Successful dentist. Hmm. Rest assured, Carol forgives you, by the way. Oh. I'm glad. Hmm. Joe tried to keep in contact with them. I, I, I actually urged him to, but um, we feel very badly about that chapter in our life. Mm. Yeah. Well, she wants to make sure that you know how thankful she is that you took him off her hands. <laughs> <laughs> She's very welcome. Joan, I hope you know that uh, hey, his affairs have nothing to do with you. That's a compulsion. I believe it's a deep-seated fear of inadequacy. Aren't you the therapist? Do you have anyone that you confide in? No. <laughs> So a while ago, the Times reviewing um, damages, a critic once said, there's no actor dead or alive as scary as a smiling Glenn Close. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, I, I love it, but I'm also, it's, it's something I wrestle with because, you know, in the, in the week that I've spent sort of thinking about talking with both of you and, and just sort of reading interviews with you and going back and watching some of the films, um, again and again, this question is posed to you about you know, why do you scare people? Why are your characters scary? Why are they so sinister? <laughs> and my hunch is that you don't, you don't see them this way. No, you know? not at all. That you're protective of them. And yes. That you, and so, but I mean. Only Cruella. Only Cruella. <laughs> I mean, wearing She's puppies. the devil. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're protective of them. You're interested in them. You have elaborate backstories for them that sometimes I don't think we know anything about when we see the film. Um, but I wanted to, to talk to both of you about what it's, it's like to uh, create or inhabit difficult women, complicated women, um, and, and what kind of space there still exists in the culture for these kinds of women. I mean, it's one of these things that when reading The Wife, published 15 years ago, it still felt groundbreaking to me. She still felt new. She still felt fresh. It still felt like, oh, I'm actually not seeing as many women like this, whose motivations I can't quite so easily parse. So, you know, um, tell me a little bit about what 
it's, it's, it's like to create these women, what it's like to see them received in the world? I think for me, one thing that I've had to learn to do is to tolerate readers like being angry at your characters or afraid of them or whatever it is. Tolerate that, because they will let you know <laughs> through various channels, you know. <laughs> But they will tell you, um, and you have to allow them, the characters, to be boring sometimes. That's a really tough one. Or jealous. In my novel, The Interestings, there was themes of envy, and I had to allow it to happen. I guess all I'm beholden to is the truth about the character. Isn't that true for you? I mean, what is it like for them? I always, that's my mantra really, what is it like? Again and again, what is it like? What is it like in the world for these people? Every novel is kind of like a an advent calendar, there are a lot of doors and ways in. Mm -hmm. And for the wife, the way in was through this angry but funny woman who finally wants to tell what happened. And she's going to tell it in her time mm -hmm. and reveal, at, reveal it the way she does. And I love her. Mm -hmm. I love Joan. I get her. But is she always likable? Of course not. But I, I love her. And that's... Mm -hmm. You have to just be, you have to honor who they are rather than what people will think of you for having written mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I think what interests me is the gray area of life. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us, if we're honest, live in the gray area of life. Mm -hmm. And it, those are the women I'm interested in. So um, for me, it starts with what's on the page. Is, is Todd here? Todd, are you here? There's somebody raising his hand. <laughs> Todd, the head writer of Damages, is here. Right. Um, one of the. <laughs> and um, we met, we met, uh, they pitched me this idea. It was really interesting because at the time, this lawyer, um, they had a, a very well known male lawyer that they were thinking of to be like this character. And I remember saying to them, but you know, if you change it to female, it would be very different. <laughs> um, but they came back with the most incredible pilot script because, and, and, I, and I signed my life away for six, a possible six years because of that one piece of writing, trusting that it would be continued, and it was in the most incredible way. But what I loved about her um, was her, her ability to make people question as to whether she was telling the truth or not. She always um, was able to keep people off balance in a way that made them more manipulatable. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that she hated bullies. I, they didn't let me write my backstory. I wasn't used to not having an ending, a bit, you know, um, but the incredible thing that they did um, was in the last uh, episode, they wrote us an amazing scene with my father. Um, and in that scene, you realize that she was the one who was damaged all this time. And you realized how, how she had been abused as a child, she and her mother. And, and she had a certain toolbox to work with. And it made me love that character, you know, even more deeply because uh, because of that damage. Um, so those are the kinds of characters that I that I find, you know. Uh, every Mike Nichols said to to me once, every, you always should have secrets. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was a great thing to hear, and I think it's very true um, because we all have secrets, you know. Yeah, going through a day, we have secrets. And I think it's um, the fascination of seeing a character and not even knowing quite what the secret is, but, but feeling that it's there somewhere. I find that uh, compelling. And it's also wonderful writing for an actor, yeah. actress. Yeah, Gabriel Garcia Marquez said this thing that I paraphrase, that there's the public self, the private self, and the secret self. Mm. And I do think that both of your work really exists in that terrain. So a somewhat sentimental question for me. What does it, how do you let go of a character that you've created and invested in, both of you? What happens to that character now? For example, meeting this character again after so many years. Um, does one still think about her? Does one still puzzle over the questions she raised for you? Or do you let go once the novel is in the world or once the film is in the world? I don't know if 
that I ever fully let go, but once in a while you bump into them, like mm. bumping into people from camp on the street. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, I kind of see characters in a novel as being sort of inhabiting like the last scene of the Truman Show when he realizes that, you know, comes up against the glass. They're always, they're living in a kind of bubble somewhere. People, I have got, I got letters from people who said things like, this is what I would like, you, please answer these questions, Ms. Wallitzer. What happened to Jules Jacobson after the end of The Interestings? Did yeah. she A, like, they imagined that I yeah. knew. <laughs> and for a small fee, I will tell you. <laughs> they imagine that there's like a secret room where the characters are living, or you, holding them hostage. dolls of them are, you know, fetish dolls. It's something so strange. Yeah. I don't see it that way. They're all, they're all sort of stuck in that Truman show world of the novel. The novel is, is a discrete thing with its own membrane, and I love being able to enter it. The beauty of this film, which is so good and powerful, um, one of the thrilling things for me as the writer, I mean, it's like the icing on the cake. You get to have a movie made starring Glenn Close. I mean, it's so wonderful, um, because most of us just novelists lead these lives of quiet desperation in bathrobes. Um, <laughs> it's really terrific to be part of something even tangentially, um, you come, you, you sort of, a, once in a while you dip back in, they're always there. People say to me, aren't you scared of what they'll do to your book? My book is on the shelf. Mm -hmm. This is something that they've done and it's so good. Mm -hmm. My characters definitely become a part of me, not that I think about them all the time, but they represent for me a real exploration into some aspect of the human condition, you know, and, and I find that a privilege, actually. And, um, but I do, I started a costume collection of, that starts with Garp because um, I didn't want their clothes to be uh, rented out and torn apart. Um, so I recently donated 700 plus items to Indiana University, where they will be in an incredible archival facility um, for educational reasons. But that, you know, uh, there, I've learned a lot from my characters. Mm -hmm. I find working in my imagination sometimes a lot easier than living life. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, I, I feel like there are people that I've known at a certain time in my life, and I'm better off for it. But then what does it mean that when you have this person or this means to understanding something about yourself, enter the culture and shape the culture in ways? I'm thinking, I mean, we can think of the interestings, we can think of Alex Forrest and Fatal Attraction, right, who became this great big bogeyman of the 80s and then was energetically reclaimed in the last however many years as feminist icon. So what does that mean then? She's a feminist icon? I kid you not. When I was in I college, feminist listen, listen to me. I, was, I had a friend of mine who was writing her dissertation called Alex Forrest, feminist icon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's a, I'm thrilled. She's a unique, a unique person, but it's a... It's a <laughs> <laughs> feminist, but, you know, but it's, wow. It's things that, you know, it's, so what does that mean then when you have this for both of you, this, this, this private relationship with a character, with a book that then is... is I, I, the think it's, I think it's, a, again, yeah. I mean, to have a character that, that has that much resonance, it, it's, it's why, why we do it, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it, we, uh, it's not for just me, I, I seek stories and yeah. characters that will have some sort of emotional connection to the audience, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to have some sort of humanity that they can that they can identify with and maybe you know ask questions and talk and, and everything and, and to have even though bunny boiler uh, <laughs> is now part of our lexicon um, I'm astounded to hear that I'm so thrilled mm -hmm. because when the movie came out I was shocked yeah. that feminists hated her because she was a single working woman who was considered bad, evil, mm -hmm. and, um, but I kept saying, but I'm not playing a general single working woman, mm -hmm. 
playing a very specific character. Something else. Um, so, yeah, I can't wait to read that article. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Yeah, I, I, when, you hear from, when you hear from readers asking you know, things not about what happened to them in the future, um, but even that, even that actually, I have to say, I, I don't want to mock that because it means that the characters lived for them. Yeah. They really lived for them. And you go along, I mean, when I was a child, I used to tell myself novel, serial novels in my head. I had a novel that I told myself on the way to school about the two heirs to the Kraft cheese fortune. <laughs> I don't really, <laughs> I, I think it's because, this is why, because my mother, busy writing, gave us a lot of Kraft macaroni and cheese. <laughs> and I think <laughs> the, the box, you remember the box, the blue cardboard yeah, box yeah. was like in front of my face a lot. So I started making it into, we make sense of the world. There was some, we make sense of the world and I think we're hardwired for story and for character. Somebody said what we remember of the books we love isn't plot but character. That's true for me. The idea, like, if, if somebody says, refers to Joan Castleman, like, you were all talking about, like, Joan and Joe, these are people I made up in my head. <laughs> like, do you know that? Like, they, they're not real. <laughs> but that is so incredible. Yeah. That's what I love. Or Ethan Figman in The Interestings, mm -hmm. and something happens to him. I'm not going to say what, but I think you kind of understand now what it was. Um, some people get distraught about things that happen to characters. And I love that about making fiction because we're all in, living in the world at the same time. Novels are sometimes a snapshot of a moment in time, how we live. So yeah, yeah. I love that. No, I think it's funny, I just have to say when I was little, I had a little um, toy telephone yeah. and I would talk on it to imaginary people but I would only talk on it because I imagined that I owned an oil well and it could afford the phone bills. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, I think that there's something, I think people, don't, they forget it, what an act of generosity also making art is. It's something you're doing, but it's also something you're giving people and excited to see it take shape in the world. I have time for one more question from me and then we're gonna open it up for everyone uh, to ask a few questions. We're also gonna take some questions online that are coming in through Facebook Live. My last question is, is um, somewhat related to what we've just been talking about. In The Female Persuasion, you take us through uh, feminist history, thought, praxis in this country from the 60s to the present, which you have a very sly term, which you call the big terribleness. Yeah, this moment of this moment. Trump's election. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, I am curious uh, about how artists uh, think about their obligations in a, in a moment like now, where there is Institutions are vulnerable, populations are vulnerable, language feels vulnerable, truth feels vulnerable. Does it change what you do and how you look at um, what the arts are for? I think it heightens it for me. I don't want to write a polemic. I don't want to write a, a pamphlet about what it is like in this moment, but the best way that I know how to do it is through characters and how people live and how they feel and what it means to be them in this moment of time. I feel it's more urgent than ever because we live in a sense in a nonfiction world. We are glued, or we, I am glued to the 24 hour news cycle far more than I want to be. But we go to fiction for a different kind of truth, right? We go to it for how people live and make, try to make some kind of sense, even without answers. I always say, I don't have the answers. I can't wrap things up in, in my books, but I, if I show, what it feels like for people to be wrestling with ideas that matter. The great writer Mary Gordon, who was a teacher of mine early on, said something that was very, very important. She said, only write what's important. Mm -hmm. And there's a parenthetical, what's important to you? Because I don't think I'm such a freak that what's important to me isn't going to be important to some other people. And now more than ever, when we might feel frightened and uncertain of what's happening, you can look at books in which writers are wrestling with what's important, and you can wrestle with it too. Mm. Um, 
I'm, I'm very wary, but I have to make sure that it's, that because you can be skewered for being a celebrity, and if you're a celebrity, you're not supposed to have a point of view, or if you have a point of view, it's not supposed to be valid. Um, so the thing that I, that I personally find important is to show up. You don't necessarily have to make a speech. My father taught us that the act of presence is very important. Um, so for example, my daughter and I went down to the March for Life, not to do it, just to be there. Um, I, I wonder all the time, what can we do? Do we go to the street? No, I mean, but we are told that we have to vote. <laughs> That's what we have to do. Um, how, how I do it, I, you know, we, I was going door to door with my sister in Montana for an for a important um, uh, election. Um, I think, the, but the main thing I can do is choose material that I think um, will uh, have a positive um, reaction. I, I, I don't know the right word. I, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I feel with all the media going on that we have, we have a national nervous system. And um, I'm very aware of all this crap being pumped into our nervous system. And that's, that's having an effect on all of us. If I feel this anxious and this uh, stressed about what's going on, millions of other people are feeling the same way. Um, yeah. So I think we just have to do what we, what we can do within our circle of, uh, of whatever the word is. What is Influence? That? Influence, yes. Um, and uh, for me, it's the, the stories that I choose mm -hmm. to be part of. Mm -hmm. And then when I show up and I am Hopefully, we will. This is an awakening for all of us for about things that we have taken for granted. And I also really believe in my daughter's generation and in the kids that are in college and high school now. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to take some questions. Um, I think we've set up some microphones. Two questions for Ms. Holzer. Who, what uh, heroine in a novel influenced you the most when you were growing up, which read when you were fairly young? And for Ms. Close, how did you find a way to love Alex in Fatal Attraction? Um, <laughs> I think the character when I was really young that, uh, who affected me wasn't a human, but was Charlotte, <laughs> as in Charlotte's yes. Web. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every oh. writer's favorite writer, <laughs> secretly. It's true, yeah. <laughs> right? Yes. A great, you know, I wept over that book. It was the first book I cried at, and the, but it was hopeful too. You, it, was, it allowed you to hold two different ideas, sadness and possibility all at once. So that was a beautiful book. Yes. Yeah. Alex, so um, I, it's, you know, it's been written about, I've talked about it before, but um, I wanted to know the why of her behavior, so I took the script to two different psychiatrists, and they, <laughs> right, if, is this behavior uh, possible, and if so, why? What's what, created what did they it? Say? And th they came up, the woman I was playing was someone who had been incested by her father at a very, very early age, long enough to damage her, damage her personally. Why? is one of the questions if she, if she spies on the bunny being given to the little girl, which was the age that she would have been molested, why did she go and throw up in the bushes? What would she have been forced to do as a child mm -hmm. that might make her gag and yeah. throw up? Mm -hmm. That was the woman I was playing, mm -hmm. um, who was triggered probably that, damaged uh, irre irretrievably really, and um, many people who have gone through that 
They cannot have a, 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 a successful relationship, and a lot of them end up taking their own lives. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when they changed the ending and I became, you know, the, uh, that's when they, she was made into an evil psychopath. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't the woman I was playing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is for Miss Close. Um, we talked about your relationship with your daughter and that she's in this movie with you. I just was, it's kind of a double question, but I was just curious what you guys like to do together outside of acting and have you got, have you, has she taught you anything and vice versa, has, what have you taught her? Did everybody hear that? Yeah, that's so really sweet. Well, she just went back to California where she lives. Um, we, uh, we love nature. Um, so we're very happy doing things in nature together. We love our dogs. Mm -hmm. So we're always laughing and talking about our dogs. Um, we love playing backgammon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sh uh, we, loved, we just love being together. I mean, she's a wonderful cook, and I'm always lucky when she's home because she gets excited about cooking, and uh, um, I feel very spoiled. Um, I have learned so much from her. Uh, just just to be a mother and I've always felt that I was her custodian and I my job was to keep her to you know keep her safe and give her you know food and a roof over her head and but she was gonna be whoever she was and it had nothing to do with me I mean she's not me you know I thought that was because I've seen parents who for some reason expect their children to be like them and to do what they think you know their child should do and I've never understood that um, so I've had this incredible experience of observing this wonderful child grow up and she's much more social than I am and um, uh, um, what I've what I taught her um, you should write thank you notes <laughs> <laughs> Um, and um, be kind, I think. I, it's funny because she's very fierce, and she, if she was here, she'd say, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but, um, and I'm always saying, well, they, they, they were nasty because maybe they did this, and you don't know what their father was like. And, blah, blah. and she says, Mom, maybe I'm just like this. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> I get it. You're not me. <laughs> Thank you. I want to take a few questions that are coming in from Facebook. This is from someone named Deepanyan. I hope I have that right. Do you think this story of the wife is relevant to young women today, millennials? What can they take away from it? This, you're looking at me. <laughs> um, I like the one about what do you and your mom like to do together? <laughs> the hard-hitting questions. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> I play Scrabble with my mother. Oh, I know. Yeah. You're more intellectual than we are. <laughs> you know what? This novel uh, and the film of The Wife, um, again, without giving too much away and sort of, I should do like an interpretive dance to explain it rather than sort of put it in words. The deal, the bargain at the heart of the marriage, which is part of the story about ambition and sacrifice, I set it in the 1950s in the beginning when they meet and going through the decades to set it into relief, the notion of what women have given up over time. Um, it's different now, but will it be resonant? Absolutely, because you know what we're talking about still, even though it wouldn't, what happened here would be a different story, right? Don't you think if it took place now, it, it I mean, yeah, I think so. it wouldn't be the same story. No. But setting it then allows us to see things that matter now just more sharply. So I think absolutely the young people who have seen it, and you know, at least the ones I'm related to liked it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it is resonant and relevant today. I, I think it's relevant because I think um, it's in the female uh, persuasion. <laughs> I mean, I, for so many years, I would look into a man's eyes and say, who do you want me to be? Mm. I can be that, until I couldn't be it anymore. Um, and I think, I think it's really healthy for our culture, for women to say, 
who am I, and what will give me fulfillment? I was actually um, in a consciousness raising group when I was in junior high school. And we wrote, a, yeah, we wrote away to the National Organization for Women for a list of topics. And they, you know, they sent us a list of things like sexual fulfillment and you, when we wanted, when your parents won't listen. <laughs> or studying for the PSATs, don't stress out. But even from an early age, but even from an early age, I had a sense of a desire for something among people of my gender. And I think right now, Again, so many conversations are being had, and, and, uh, and people are listening. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, one of the passages from the book that resonated deeply with me starts with, everyone needs a wife. Even a wife <laughs> needs a wife. And, and, and goes on to talk about how a wife can, will make everything OK at any cost. And I recently had an opportunity, actually, to address the, um, a meeting of the National Organization of Women, talking about women who still are, you know, working women who are bringing home the majority of their household income and yet still carrying all of that wifely burden. And I, I, I think it's very relevant today, I, I mean, perhaps even more so than it was when you wrote it, because there's. There's, a, I think, a coming out now of, of women in many respects, saying, just as you were saying, Ms. Close, about knowing what's OK with you and being willing to say it and to stand up for yourself and what's right. And it's just, I guess it's, it's more of a reflection than a question, but it was, it, it was deeply moving to me and very empowering, I think, even, even at my age and in a more advanced stage of life, to be able to say, no, I, I'm, I'm not OK just making it OK for you. Thank you. Meg, hi. Hi. Um, I just want to say on behalf of Poets and Writers how great it is to see you here tonight. You. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you decide what the next book is you're going to write? Because you, your spectrum of topics is so broad. And Glenn, I'd love to ask you, how do you decide what the next part is that you want to take? Because your spectrum of parts is so broad. Mm -hmm. So I'm just interested in where does that nugget of inspiration come from? The next project. The next project. Um, I'll take ideas from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> anything? You got anything? I, I need it. I, whatever you got. You know, people say to writers, you know, write what you know. For me, as I've said many times, it is write what obsesses you. There's one really good way to know what obsesses you, but nobody would want to do it. Look at everything you've Googled for the past 24 hours. <laughs> that is so terrifying. Okay. For me, it would be a cross between Virginia Woolf and does this mole look suspicious. <laughs> and that, is not, that is not a good novel. But the truth, although maybe. The mole looking suspicious is a good novel. That might be. <laughs> but not like. Virginia woke up. Does this mo look suspicious? She asked Leonard. Um, I think that it really, but seriously, what are you thinking about all the time? And then somehow it rises to the surface eventually. Uh, the things you've been thinking about, they start to kind of form. I love to talk to my editor, who I had lunch with yesterday, and we really talk things over. And it's not the book that someone else wants you to write. It can't be that. Just like it can't be the parts. It, it has to be the thing that speaks to you. And with a little luck, it kind of appears. I never know what will come my way that I'll be attracted to. Um, I am, I do have a next project, which is I will do a new play by Jane Anderson at the Public Theater. Uh, about, yeah. So good. It's terrifying. Um, it's called Mother of the Maid. I will play Joan of Arc's mother. And, um, I've been doing a lot of reading about the Middle Ages. <laughs> and it's, inter it's interesting, because um, I want to have in my head what's outside our door. Not terribly different from now. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. And I, and I'm, I actually am uh, attracted to roles that, that again, it's not um, territory that I've explored before. Thank you. Any more questions from Facebook? Um, 
This is another question about you and your daughter, Glenn. Oh, nice. Glenn, did you work with your daughter on how you would both characterize uh, your character as a whole character? What was that process like for you? That's an interesting question. I should have asked that question. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> no regrets. How do you do it to no, no regrets. <laughs> Uh, yes, we did. We, we sat around a table for a, a week before we started shooting. And uh, with Jane, uh, the, the uh, screenwriter, and Bjorn, our director. And Annie, it was really her job to establish the, the character of Joan. Hmm. Because, you know, even though you don't see it in the beginning of the film, uh, when you see their scenes, that's when their life together started. And, uh, and there were certain uh, aspects of her personality that were very important to kind of establish so that 40 years from that moment, uh, it could be a seamless transition. And um, so uh, I said, it's all up to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was, I was so proud of her. I, when, when, we, when she filmed that and they filmed it first, I decided the best thing would be to get out of town so I literally went, we, in Glasgow, I went into the Highlands and uh, she didn't have to bump into me in the hallway. But I was so proud when I saw her work. She's so good. What she's done, yeah. She's incredible. She's so good. She's beautiful. Um, and I have one last question from Facebook. Um, it's from Kathy. Are there historical figures you would like to see highlighted in books and films that you both admire? It's more for you. Mm. No. Is there anybody who hasn't gotten their due? Even as a writer, as a... Oh, so many great women. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, Can't get who enough of the really, Brontes. Who is that really? really <laughs> was it Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who had like yeah. the worst hair, hairdo in the world? <laughs> I'd like to play one of those women. Yeah. One of those, you just, yeah. One of those. Or how about now? Is there a writer, Meg, that you can recommend who you think isn't getting her due, who we should know about? Oh, God. Now I'm going to, like, I, you know. It's a lot. It's, it, it, I know. On the spot, it's a lot to sort of come up with. But. I don't know that I also want to say not getting her due. That's mm -hmm. like, it's a little, you know, I don't know enough, what yeah. one's due is. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking backstage about loving Willa Cather, mm -hmm. uh, a writer who has, I don't know, what does one's do? She's ever, you know, people read her, but I love her to this day. Mm -hmm. I love Virginia Woolf. I love, this is, uh, this is, I'll tell you the novel, and I wrote about it for the Times for the Enthusiast column. It's by a man, but it's about a woman, Mrs. Bridge, mm -hmm. uh, by Evan S. Canal. It's one of the great, beautiful 20th century novels. Uh, Written, it was published in 1959, and it's about a Kansas City housewife before, before World War II. And she's an ordinary woman. And I think that writers who just don't need to make a splash, but just show again and again, what is it like for that person? And when you feel the sense of other people having lived, I'm very moved by that. The idea, we were talking backstage about Joan of Arc and the things that she did, right? Like, Amazing. Where does that come from? How does a person become herself? I think that that's what novels and great roles and great actor, actresses do, uh, show us. Well, we're lucky to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>